that it is um, meeting all its core objectives. That is what corporate governance is all about. What mechanisms are there in place to ensure that the core objectives, the core values, and all these things we will uh, flesh out a little later on, but who is to ensure that a business operation goes in the right direction? Obviously, we said on several occasions from different perspectives that when people set up, when somebody establishes or a group of persons establish a business entity, obviously the intention is for them to, um, to make a profit at the end of the day. And so in terms of making a profit, having that company sustainable, having that company survive um, economies which are good, which may become weak, it is always very important to ensure that somebody at the helm is steering the company in the right direction. And so corporate governance has to do with um, not only who is at the helm, but more importantly, which direction are they taking the entity. We have seen, um, obviously, in last week, we would have dealt with some of the fiascos, financial fiascos that we would have seen over the years, particularly in 2007, 2008. Um, and all of those had to do with, I suggest to you, the absence of good corporate governance. And so corporate governance has to do with how a company is directed, controlled, managed to the benefit of all stakeholders. We're going to flesh out who the stakeholders are we're talking about, but I just want you to understand that concept. How would you operate, how would you manage a business in such a way that all relevant stakeholders benefit. The flip side of that is, if, you are ma if you're looking at how a business is managed, you need to ensure that nobody is adversely affected by any bad decisions which may be made for the business. And so corporate governance has to do with ensuring that everything goes in the right direction uh, to the benefit, to, uh, to the advantage of all of the stakeholders. Now, we want to look next at um, some international developments in corporate governance. I submit to you, and if you were to take out your nugget sheets, you have some nuggets uh, for Unit 8. I wish to suggest to you respectfully that when we are talking about this whole business of corporate governance, you can look at it from several perspectives. There are certain international bodies, international organizations, and even some jurisdictions which have articulated their stands on corporate governance. They have said very clearly, this is what corporate governance means to us, and these are the obligations institutions will have to ensure that they um, have good corporate governance framework. And so, um, again, we're talking about corporate governance being the ultimate responsibility of the board of directors. Um, yeah. Corporate governance being the responsibility of the board of directors. And so when you're talking about um, who is at the helm, again, remember the board of directors set the tone within an organization. The board of directors, um, those persons are responsible ultimately for when a company succeeds, they get all the accolades, um, similarly, if a company fails, they ought to bear the brunt of the responsibility. Obviously, there's collective responsibility, but the ultimate responsibility rests with the board of directors. And so, uh, let's look at a couple of things that corporate governance could be adversely affected by. There are certain things that if they are not in place, corporate governance will hardly work. And the first one of those we're going to look at is inefficient or insufficient board oversight. If you have a business where the board is not sufficiently um, overlooking or ensuring that things are going in the right direction, you can run into some problems. You can run into problems because foremost, um, the board has responsibility for checking on the operation. Even though we have a clear differentiation between the responsibility of board members and the person at the helm in the way of a chief executive officer or a managing director, whoever sits at the helm, that is very different from very different from 
um, when you're talking about corporate governance and who actually sets the tone, it's usually set at the top. So when there is insufficient board oversight, that can cause a problem for corporate governance. Um, when you have inadequate risk management uh, protocols in place, that can cause a problem. Meaning that, remember, compliance is all about managing risk. Compliance is all about how an institution goes about managing the money laundering, terrorism financing, in general, um, risks that face the institution. And so when you're talking about inadequate risk management, that can adversely affect corporate governance. The other one is unduly uh, complex um, organizational structure. If the structure is such that um, from day to day, you don't know who's in charge, you don't know who reports to who. Um, any of you know any organizations where, I mean, you can't tell who's in charge, you go there and um, the yeah. reporting lines are all confused. Um, there's no, obviously no complaints handling, and we're gonna talk about that a little later on, but when there is a complaint, um, you cannot speak to anybody who can give you any satisfactory um, response. Um, in fact, some organizations, um, have you ever had a discussion with somebody about his or her organization, and you are challenged to understand how they operate, who runs it? It's almost like um, on a daily basis, anything goes, anybody on you? Don't call any name, please don't call any name. We don't wanna, we don't wanna put the institute at risk for any libel or any, uh, but some of you would have come across institutions where uh, the structure are that complex that you cannot make any sense of it. That impedes the progress or success of corporate governance. And, um, and then you have some institutions where the activities within the institutions are so varied, so complex, that, um, that they just spread themselves so thin that it's difficult to make sense or to control the institution. Do you know that an institution can outgrow its ability to be managed properly? You have some businesses which would have started out in a product line, maybe one or two products, and then they expand, and then they continue to expand, and they make more money, and so they continue to add to their product line, so much so that when you check the institution again, you find out that it is not nearly as effective, as efficient, as it used to be. Anybody know an institution like that? Again, don't call anybody's name. But you, you understand what I'm saying. An institution can actually grow so big that it becomes um, difficult to manage the institution. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, a structure that uh, lends itself to um, affecting the, the corporate governance structure. Let us look at what the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development um, has to say about this whole business of um, corporate governance. Um, we know that the OECD, as it's commonly referred to, that is something that you, it's an organization that you want to keep in the forefront of your mind. You want to look at what the OECD has been doing over the last couple of decades. Anybody want to share with us why that's important? Why is it important to note what the OECD is doing? How many of you would say, somebody want to share with us um, the mandate? What do you understand the OECD to be doing? Okay, since you all are putting up your hand one time, you can allow everybody to speak one time. Thank you, and I'm, I'm happy that you said the original. They did start out with an original mandate, which um, in the views and in the minds of many people was a very prudent thing to do, um, looking at economies and looking at how they can remain sustainable and uh, whether their tax structures were um, properly aligned with um, the economies and the like. Um, over the years, and you need to know this, over the years, the OECD um, has been working so close with the Financial Action Task Force that it's difficult to differentiate the two organizations. In fact, um, if you have not already done so, 
um, go to the OECD's website and look at the countries that make up the membership of the OECD. Then go to the FATF website and look at the countries that make up the membership. And so my point is be very, very cognizant of the work of the OECD because it is not very different from that of the Financial Action Task Force. And so even though you will hardly see the OECD tied into anti-money laundering, indirectly, that's a part of what they're doing too. And so when you see that they make some pronouncements about corporate governance, you want to be very um, cautious and, and put those in your mind as being something that's very, very attuned um, to a good compliance program. So what does the OECD um, say? First and foremost, um, I share with you, um, in your notes, you would see that um, a definition of sort is given for the OECD's perspective on corporate governance. It talks about the sort of relationship between a company's management, its boards, its shareholders, and other stakeholders. That's critical, um, because the OECD looks at corporate governance as being that important relationship which is fostered between the management and all relevant stakeholders of an organization. Um, how does the company treat its shareholders? Uh, do they look out for the rights of, of uh, the shareholders? Do they look out for the rights of all of the other stakeholders? So the OECD is very concerned that corporate governance um, ought to be concerned with ensuring that everybody who has a particular interest Whatever that interest is, how big that interest might be um, in an institution, that their interests uh, are secure. And so make sure you um, um, make, uh, keep attuned to the OECD's perspective on um, corporate governance. You will see that uh, in, in your notes that the OECD, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and the Commonwealth Association of Corporate Governance, they all came together and they created another set of principles. When you're looking at principles, make sure that you look for a common thread within the principles. Um, no matter how long the list may be, um, don't worry about the list. Try to make sense of what it is that they are, they are going after. And when you look at the principles here, they all have to do with um, protecting the rights of a certain group of persons. Different angles it comes from, but when you look at it, they talk about protecting the rights. Um, and so for those three groups, they gave some principles and we'll just go through uh, some of them. The first one they talked about is the importance of ensuring an effective corporate governance framework. Every institution that is serious about compliance will have a solid uh, compliance uh, uh, corporate governance uh, framework. Then they talk about the rights of shareholders and, and key. I have a bit of concern about the word key there, but it's in your notes, and so you want to keep in mind that they said key shareholders. Um, I think it ought to be all shareholders, okay? But if the people what they want, that's their information. Say key shareholders. My view, again, not personal, I'm sure that some of you may agree with me, that the rights of all shareholders ought to be protected. Anybody agree with me on that? That's good. You also want to talk about um, avoiding conflict of interest. If you have a company that it is not, um, have, if it does not have a proper corporate governance framework in place, um, it lends itself to conflicts of interest by some of its stakeholders. Um, we will see a little later on when we talk about some of the board's responsibility, that if you're not careful who is placed on the board, who is in senior management, these persons can actually have conflicts within the institution. Some of them may, may be a board member or senior manager within a financial institution, and they have interest in a competing institution. Or they may have um, you know, family members at the helm of another institution. There are so many ways you can look at uh, conflicts of interest. They arise from so many perspectives. But make sure that you understand and you can appreciate and articulate that a good corporate governance regime tries to avoid um, conflicts of interest. The next thing you want to be sure is that the corporate governance structure um, 
is able to identify, manage, um, and properly monitor the different risks within the institution. The corporate governance structure ought to do that. And then uh, disclosure, um, transparency procedures, just to make sure that when you're talking about sharing information, information within and going outside the institution, that that process occurs in a transparent manner. You're talking about the responsibilities, duties, and obligation of members of the board. The OECD continues to come from different angles, but continue to say that the board has serious responsibilities. Serious responsibilities when it comes to corporate governance. And so if you are members on the board of directors who do not know their responsibilities, they don't know their duties, um, to them it's a social acumen, it is something that they can brag about that really adversely affects the strength of the corporate governance regime. If you have board members who do not understand what they're supposed to be doing, remember it is them who are directing the organization if they do not understand how to do that um, and how to manage the risk, the institution is in trouble. Um, that the board directors also ought to ensure that you have um, good key performance indicators. Where is this company going? That's a part of corporate governance. Remember, the board is concerned, ought to be concerned with the overall survival, sustainability of the institution. And so somebody has to pause periodically and to say, is this company going in the right direction? If we continue what we are doing, will we meet our core objectives? Will we meet our mandate? Um, will we meet our financial um, mandate as relates to um, you know, our budgetary projection? Somebody ought to be checking that um, on a regular basis. And so, and then the next point is effective structure to ensure compliance with regulatory obligations. A good, comply a good corporate governance regime ensures that the institution complies with regulatory obligations. You cannot have a, an effective corporate governance regime that has no regard for regulatory uh, requirements, meaning that even when a, a, an institution is framing its corporate governance document, policies, procedures, they ought to um, be mindful of the regulatory obligation for that type of institution. And that not even only from a, a local perspective, they ought to look more broadly at the global requirements for that type of institution. And so that's the OECD. What you would want to do is to be able to clearly articulate the OECD's view, obligations, requirements as it relates to corporate governance. Um, the flip side of that, or another perspective, would be um, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Remember now, you will see quite a bit of the information in this unit speaks to the banking sector. And so you have to recognize that when you are looking at things from the banking sector, be careful not to transpose that on every type of business. It might not be relevant for every business. There are some things that the Basel um, core principles deal with which are specifically for banks. And so what you want to do is make sure that if you're using a scenario of, let's say, um, somebody may choose a casino or a real estate firm um, in answering a question on the examination, be careful that you do not go too far down the road talking about um, Basel's core principles on banking. Um, that can take you in the wrong direction. You ought to know it, but make sure that you apply it properly. That is the point I'm making. And so Basel has some um, uh, core principles, which are not very different, but you want to be able to articulate them from Basel's perspective. Um, but again, Basel talks about effective um, a system which prevents conflict of interest. Sounds familiar? OECD is concerned with conflict of interest. So is Basel. Um, talk about the rules of internal and external auditors. You see where the banking one is going? You're talking about um, the importance of having an effective audit committee in place. And over the years, you would have seen that many institutions really got in trouble because there was an absence of a strong audit committee 
audit group. In fact, the audit function uh, was ne not nearly as strong as it ought to be. And so Basel comes from the angle of having a strong audit function and goes further to say that they ought to be um, an audit committee. In fact, um, and then they go further to talk about uh, transparency in, um, in challenging structures. Again, sounds familiar. You see where they are also coming from the angle that if the structure is too complex, it's going to be difficult to try to understand how do you go about managing the structure. Um, some companies have done so well or have taken on a staff complement that exceeds the ability to manage the staff complement. Some institutions are so large that, um, you know, they don't, well, uh, they're going to get this from two perspectives. Some companies are so large that it is difficult to effectively how oversight of what people are doing on a daily basis. Um, some people, some departments are so large that um, it is almost impossible for somebody to really keep a tune to all that they do. You would, you can do that. Caution though, when you start to talk about outsourcing, you're giving up a lot of your right to manage something and to have proper oversight. Now based on the type of arrangement that you put in place in terms of the outsourcing arrangement and determining who reports to who, how do they go about doing what they do, you want to make sure put mechanisms in place so that you don't lose track of that function altogether. Outsourcing is good, uh, particularly nowadays where a lot of companies um, uh, are trying to cut the bottom line, trying to make sure that they cut expenses, um, try, to, sorry, sorry, try to improve the bottom line and try to cut expenses. What they're trying to do is cut the cost of doing business, and outsourcing has helped with that. However, outsourcing is dangerous sometimes if you allow it. Well, <laughs> from that perspective, somebody says that it, you know, it, it lends to unemployment. But another point, too, is that it has worked for some companies, but the process must be managed. And so um, the role of supervisors, again, to further the point I was making just now, if you do not have effective supervisors, that can adversely affect your ability to have a strong corporate governance um, regime in place. Um, supervisors who, uh, first of all, know what they're doing, um, can supervise properly and keep their eyes on carefully structured goals and objectives. You have some supervisors who, you know, they, they love the titles. They just love to be able to, they just love to be called supervisors, you know. But, then what is contemplated here by Basel is that when somebody is called a supervisor, particularly if that person is in senior management, that that person ought to know what he or she is responsible for, and that person has proper oversight of the things that they, um, they are he or she is responsible for. And then you go further to look at, um, Anytime you see in your notes uh, some reports, some principles, you want to be mindful of that. Uh, you want to have a look at those. Um, so you see in your notes your report by the Basel um, Committee. Uh, the report is called Principles for Enhancing Corporate Governance, which was issued in 2010. Um, again, I look around and I know you all have them, but I would have loved to see more stickies and flyers and I know you keep them home, sorry. <laughs> My point is you want to carefully and quickly um, label your information for easy access and just make sure that you are able to um, tie in some concepts, tie in some things like this um, document, this principle, this report that the Basel um, group has done because they talked uh, about some other key elements of the corporate governance structure. They talked about um, that a company ought to be able to determine the risk appetite of the company. That's a part of corporate governance. 
um, how risk tolerant is the company. Risk, compliance, they go hand in hand. And so when you're talking about what is the risk tolerance of a company, that can take you down so many different roads. Because based on the risk tolerance, that determines the kind of clientele that the company would be um, satisfied with. That would tell you the types of products and services that the company would um, end up providing. Risk tolerance is key, critical to the strength of the corporate governance structure. Um, again, it talks about how, how to operate a bank, and again, most the reference is to a bank on a day-to-day -day basis. We talked about protecting the interests of major shareholders. We talked about aligning compliance activities with the integrity um, and compliance with laws and regulation. All of these points here from the Basel Committee can be put into six broad categories which are listed on your sheet. Um, you can look at those at your leisure, but make sure that you understand that there are six broad groups that corporate governance can fall into. Um, again, the first and foremost, I will go through all of them, but first and foremost, you're looking at board practices. What does the board do? How does the board operate? Um, who constitutes the board in the first place? Uh, you would have in many institutions where major stakeholders, major shareholders, are not even cognizant of who sits on the board of the institutions that they have their monies in. Um, I wouldn't ask around the class, but think about it. You perhaps know some people um, who are members, employees of an organization and do not know the board of that organization. Who make up the board in your institution? Don't answer. A lot of people um, uh, really do not know. But it's important to know who's at the hand. If you're on a ship and taking a cruise, a family cruise, um, or you're going somewhere on a plane, you want to know that the person at the helm knows what he or she is doing, right? When we concerned? Politically appointed? Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but moving right along. Um, and then we go into this whole other aspect that speaks of um, this business of the chief risk officer. How many of you within your institution would have um, a risk function? that is separate from all the other function. Is it separate from the compliance function? They, they work together? Separate. They, they go together. Separate. Separate. OK. And so for good corporate governance framework, um, it is suggested that there might be a risk function. And that risk function is headed by the chief risk officer. And that person has some serious responsibility. Not only that, that does that person have some serious responsibility, you see in your notes it is articulated that that person ought to be given certain freedoms, certain um, leverages uh, to operate effectively. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that a little later on. But the chief risk officer is, is very, very important. <coughs> Notice that uh, in the banking industry, there are two main areas um, that you want to focus on when you're looking at your corporate governance structure, um, that, the, that the institution is going in the right direction and that they have um, the mechanisms in place to uh, properly approve the direction, the corporate direction, and that they have the authority to approve um, how the business operates on a daily basis. And so, you know, there are some other categories there. The risk strategy. How do they go about mitigating and managing risk? Um, are there policies for risk? Uh, are there internal controls? Um, is there a corporate governance framework in place? And um, compensation uh, system. Compensation. A key word. You cannot talk about corporate governance without touching on this whole business of compensation and how our people are rewarded they do. We know that a lot of the fiascos of 2007-2008 had to do with, it raised the question about compensation. Um, it, are, are board members properly compensated? Are board members given enough um, to avoid them looking elsewhere? 
um, or the board members get too much money, um, so much that um, that they do not want to leave the board. And you will see a little later in our notes where anybody aware of some boards of directors where for 50 years and they won't want to leave because it is so sweet and the benefits are so sweet and they don't have to do anything. And so compensation is critical from two perspectives. First and foremost, compensation is important and it has to be, it has to be tempered with how the business is doing. You cannot um, agree to overcompensate board members. That's going to get you into trouble. You obviously should not underpay or undercompensate board members. Uh, when persons are underpaid, when persons are underpaid, they find ways to make up the difference. <laughs> almost every fraud case, almost every case that somebody stole some money, the person justified somehow by saying, they weren't paying me enough in the first place. So, you know, I had to make, I had to make it up. I had to make up the difference. I mean, we talked about that two weeks ago. Um, you know, whatever, whatever HR agrees to pay you, you learn to live on that. And so whatever um, is determined to be the compensation for the board of directors, the directors on the board, um, those directors ought to satisfy with that. And it ought to be something that is, um, that is proper for the institution. And so compensation is, is very important. Who determines what they should Again, it's, it happens at board meetings, uh, shareholders um, meetings. No, again, remember we talked about a couple of weeks ago where you are shareholders and you go to the AGMs and um, you ought to have a voice. First of all, you ought to know. Remember my question a couple of minutes ago? You ought to know what the compensation is for board members. And when you have a stake, when you have an interest in an institution, you have a right to know what they're paying the board members. But how many persons really, really inquire about John? Um, but you're, you're speaking with respect to perhaps public, public companies. companies. Yeah, yeah. But we have some strange creatures here in the financial services industry yeah. where mm -hmm. the board of directors may in fact be the owners of the bank. Yes, and they they're they having them. challenges with respect to corporate governance in those areas because mm -hmm. Certainly, I, I, I totally agree with you, and those, uh, when we talk about those types of, I don't want to call them creatures, those types of institutions, um, that is not what's really contemplated here. We talk about our straight, obviously traded companies, and don't get me wrong, you can transfer.